Good morning, Mount Hall. Happy Sunday to you. Happy Pentecost to you. Happy birthday, church. That's right. Somebody said happy birthday. That's exactly right. Now, if the calculations are correct, that makes the church 1,988 years old today. This is the birthday of the church. This is the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out, so we celebrate that. And that's, that's going to be the first announcement before we officially get to the announcements is after service today, downstairs, there's cake. So come and join us for a piece of cake and fellowship, get a cup of bad coffee, and we'll sit, sit there and tell lies. No, we won't. Let's open in a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, the name above all names, Lord. And we just thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you, Lord, through the rainy weather and through the lightning and the thunder, Lord, that you are still on the throne and you're in control. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house today, Lord. We lift up our praises to you. We ask that you would fill this place to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would rule and reign here, and that everything that we do this morning would be an act of worship and glorify you unto your throne. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So as I said, today is Pentecost, or the first fruits, and you guys are the first fruits. You're the first fruits of Jesus. You're members of the church, and you are God's elect picked from the foundation of the world. Now, next Sunday, June the 7th, is Potluck Sunday and also Communion Sunday. So we'll be taking communion together as a church, and also we will be going downstairs after service and breaking bread together. We're going to get back to a place of normalcy once again. So invite a friend. Invite a friend to church. Now, some of you may have seen, God bless you, some of you may have seen the Supreme Court ruling that says that uh, you could only, churches now can only go to 25% of their capacity or 100 people, whatever is, uh, whatever is more in that particular case, or whatever is less. I think, I think we're safe at 100 people, so we don't have to worry about that. Let's get people to come back to church and tell them it's safe. If they want to wear their masks, that's great. Social distancing, that's great. That's fine. We have hand sanitizer all through the church, but it's time to get back to life at the same time and not be afraid because God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and joy and a sound mind. So join us next Sunday here at Mount Hall Community Church for Potluck Sunday and Communion Sunday. And then in July, July 12th, we are renting the pavilion area there at Twin Rivers uh, Resort. And we're going to have our baptism and our barbecue and a time of fellowship. There's going to be a time of swimming down there where we can take over the pond, uh, bring the kids, bring the grandkids. Uh, it's free of charge to you. The church is going to provide uh, the burgers and the hot dogs and all that neat stuff. And as I said last week, if you have something that is really exotic, if you have something that's really strange, what I like to call mystery meat, and it's in the freezer and you want to put it on the grill, bring it out. We'll cook it up. We're going to have a good time. So Sunday, July the 12th, right after service, we'll meet down there at about 2 p.m. and we'll go until wherever, whenever you want. It says 2 to 4, but whenever you want. We have the pavilion with the refrigerator and the barbecues and all that. It's going to be a great time. Now, we're going to forego taking an offering until we get to the next stages of this social distancing COVID-19 stuff. So if you have tithes and offerings, our tithe and offering box is right at the back of the service, or back of the, the sanctuary, excuse me. Uh, that's between you and the Lord. Also, if you're watching us online or on Facebook or on YouTube, you can go to our website at mthallcc.com and look for the online giving link. Now, that's like PayPal for Christians, except uh, the giving link that we use is through a company called Greed Be Gone. It's a Christian organization, and we do that specifically so that we are not supporting things that are contrary to the Christian faith. So that's between you and the Lord. That is your option to do. And at this time, let's go ahead and worship the Lord together, shall we? I'd like to invite you to stand up and sing along with me. Who am 
mind that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. Wave tossed in the ocean. Paper in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you've told me who I am. I am yours. Sorry. Who am I? That the eyes that see my sin look on me with love and watch me rise again. Who am I that the voice that calm the sea call out through the rain, calm the storm in me, not because of who. But because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are, I am. before him in praise at all is that he has chosen us. Um, this next song about how deep the Father's love is for us, to me, you know, I wasn't thinking about current events so much as I picked this song, but the more I've practiced this song this week, the more I see, I certainly don't want to try to speak for Mount Hall. I don't even want to speak for me on what I think about what's going on in our country right now. But especially as we get to the second verse and you see a look back into a riot scene that happened 1900 years ago, 1988 years ago. And there's soldiers on one side who are doing something that's totally unjust. There's a mob on the other side who's doing something that's absolutely despicable. That was me. And what, where my heart's gone as I've watched what's going on the last week or so in Minneapolis and so on and so forth is that I'm like that. And yet he still loved me. Mm -hmm. 
How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to we see John standing before the throne and the scroll is there and nobody's worthy to open it but then they find the lamb this song's being sung in heaven constantly Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Holy, holy is He Sing a new song To Him who sits on Heaven's mercy seat Yeah. 
color Flashes of light Rolls of thunder Blessing and honor Strength and glory And power be To you the only wise King Holy, holy, holy Is the Lord God Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder. Awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Yeah, yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the God Almighty was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. I will. worship him. I love to sing, but it doesn't mean anything if that doesn't walk out the door with us. Empty hands held high, such small sacrifice, not joined with my life. Sing in vain tonight. May the words I say, the things I do, let my life song sing, bring a smile to you. Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song. Day, knowing that my heart was true, let my life song sing to you. Lord, I give you my life, a living sacrifice, to reach a world in need. I'll be your hands and feet. May the words I say. And the things I do Let my life song sing Bring a smile to you Let my life song sing to you Let my life song sing to you I want to sign your name of this day, knowing that my heart was true, that my life song sing to you, hallelujah, hallelujah, let my life song sing to you, hallelujah. Hallelujah, let my life.
life song sing to you. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life song sing. Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life song sing to you. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Hello again. Well, now that Craig has opened that uh, can of worms, so to speak, I just feel like I have to say that uh, that which took place on TV that we all saw with the officer in Minneapolis, um, I'm sure that my brethren who also wore a badge felt the same way that I did. It's inexcusable. It was a violation of the public trust. It made me sick to my stomach as someone who spent his entire adult life uh, serving for what he thought was serving the community and that's that's what I did and I know um, Steve and Lou f feel the same way I'm sure that they do uh, so it makes our profession look bad it was terrible it was disgraceful the flip side of the coin ter watching our nation be torn apart that equally saddens me because order has to be restored and there are people that are no doubt out there just trying to instigate trouble and violence and trying to destroy everything that our country is so let's keep this all in prayer. There has to, all this has to be put down and order has to be restored. Let's just pray it's done in such a way that it's done professionally and that once again our nation can begin to heal. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. And as you're turning there, Author and pastor R.A. Torrey, who was a contemporary and close friend of D.L. Moody, co-founder of the D.L. Moody Bible Institute and also found, founder of Biola University, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, wrote this, We feel the breath of the wind upon our cheeks. We see the dust and the leaves blowing before the wind. We see the vessels at sea driven swiftly toward their ports, but the wind itself remains invisible, just so with the Spirit. We feel his breath upon our souls. We see the mighty things that he does, but himself we do not see. He's invisible, but he is real and perceptible. Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. But when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them, withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, 
both Jews and Greeks. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord. We thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for this time of worship. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would make this abundantly clear to us, that you would speak to our hearts. I pray for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit to be poured out on me, and also for the congregation, that you would lead us and guide us in truth, Father. Help us to set aside everything that's going on in our lives, both good and bad, and to focus on what you have for us this morning. And I pray if I say anything that is not of you, Father, I ask that it falls to the ground unheard. We thank you and praise you, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week, we studied about the importance of discipleship. And discipleship simply is making others, training up others to follow in your path, to do so to speak as you have done. So if we're to follow after Christ and imitate him, just as as Paul said, imitate me just as I imitate Christ, then we're to train up others to do the exact same thing righteously, to follow after God. We read where Paul lived and discipled this husband and wife team, Aquila and Priscilla, who then they turned around and spent time with Pastor Apollos, who was a Jew who had come up from Alexandria in Egypt. Now, the principle is to create Christians, and Christian means little Christ. And hopefully, when people see us, they see Jesus in us. They want us. We want them to see Jesus with skin on. We need to be his hands and feet. That's the idea. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it says, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was for a whole year that they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, the first time that term Christian was used, and it was here in Antioch, it was a put down. It's like you guys are acting like a bunch of little Jesuses, essentially, is what, what they were saying. But this is a badge of honor. This is something that we should all look at with pride. Not pride in ourselves, but pride in God, that he is changing us and making us more into the likeness of his son, Jesus. That should be all of our goals. That's our challenge, to live our lives in such a way where people see Jesus in us. And then we saw where Paul and Aquila and Priscilla, they then traveled to Ephesus. And then Paul spent a short time there. He taught in the synagogue, but then he went on. He had to uh, present his, his offering there. He wanted to attend the feast, so he goes to Jerusalem. Very little is said about that, and then moves back to his home church there at Antioch. And Antioch is where he begins again his third missionary journey, and that's where we're at right now. And last week we saw where he went back in order. He went back to Phrygia and also to Galatia, to all those churches, Derby and Iconium and Lystra and, and Antioch and Pisidia. All those churches he had established, he visited them in order, uh, in order to strengthen them or edify them. So we went back to make sure how they were doing, to check and just not leave them to their own devices. He probably taught there a couple of weeks. He wanted to make sure that there was church leadership in place and take them through the word of God. And if there was anything that were going wrong or false doctrine that was coming in, Paul would have corrected it right then and there. So this morning, we continue in our line-by-line and word-by-word study of the entire Bible. My message title is Return to Ephesus. So let's begin and tear it apart. Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. And it happened, while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. So remember, Paul, or excuse me, Apollos, He had a letter of reference or recommendation from Aquila and Priscilla and the brethren, and he was sent on back to Achaia, which is Corinth, and he is now assuming the duties, basically a pastor there in Corinth, where he is teaching and mentoring the church back in Corinth. Meanwhile, Paul is making his his way through Asia, what's present-day Turkey, and as we've just talked about, he is strengthening those churches But now he comes back to Ephesus where he's just left just a short time ago. And it says he finds some disciples. Now when you see in the Bible where it's talking about disciples, and then unless it specifically says something else, it's talking about disciples or followers of Jesus. So these are Christ followers that we see. So where Aquila and Priscilla and the brethren and the churches in Ephesus They wrote this letter to Apollos, so Apollos goes on. And at this point, we don't know. Probably Aquila and Priscilla, they went with him. 
And this guy, Apollos, was such a good guy. He was strong in the word. He was an eloquent public speaker. He knew the Bible. He could teach God's word. And after spending some time together in the word, they addressed some issues about Paul's, uh, Apollos' theology. Remember when Aquila and Priscilla talked to him about that? So that's a discipleship that's going on, iron sharpening iron. And then Apollos goes back, and he goes to minister to the established church that Paul had set up there in Corinth. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And that's exactly what Aquila and Priscilla did with Apollos, so that he would more accurately teach God's word. Now, this is what we would call today constructive criticism. Constructive criticism, not to tear somebody down, but if you have a friend and you, or a loved one and they're doing something that you know is not quite right, you go to them in love and say, okay, this is what I saw you say over here, but this is what God's word says. Now, we're called to do that. We're, we're called to come alongside. That's what it means, iron sharpens iron, where we work this stuff out as a church family together. So this is an example of constructive criticism that they did with Apollos, and it also shows us Apollos' heart. Pa Apollos has a heart to receive and not to argue. So he was looking, okay, if I can be corrected and I can do this better, I want to do that. So he is receiving that with humility. He's humble. He receives the, cr the criticism. He's not proud. He's not saying, well, wait a minute. Did you hear me talk in the synagogue? Didn't you hear what I said? I was great today. That's not the heart at all. Instead, he was trying to accurately preach the word of God. So he receives it. And so now with Apollos back in Corinth, Paul comes back into Ephesus. And if you look up on the map on the screen, you'll see this is a Paul's third missionary journey, and it shows the track that he went. So he goes all the way back up the coast of Syria into what we see Turkey today, all this on foot and going right across back to the coast where Ephesus is. Needless to say, I, I imagine that Paul wore out some shoes in his day. So he arrives back in Ephesus, and this is the place where Paul had said, I will return. Remember, we looked at that, kind of like General Douglas MacArthur when he left the Philippines. I shall return. But Paul, God willing, and that's what he said, he does return. And remember when he was there the first time, he taught in the local synagogue, but he didn't stay long. They wanted him to stay, and they had questions of him to ask him, and Paul says, no, I have to go to Jerusalem, and I have to make and present this offering at the feast. So now Paul is back, and he finds these disciples there. So this tells us there is an established church by now there in Ephesus, a church that believes in Jesus Christ. Now, when Paul was there before, it didn't say when he taught in the synagogue that many Jews and Greeks had come to the Lord. It didn't say that. It just said that Paul had taught, and they had more questions. So Paul had reasoned with them, or he argued, which was his practice, essentially debating. He debates in the synagogue in order to swing people over so that they would see Jesus as the Messiah. But these guys had more questions. So no doubt Paul is somewhat surprised when he finds these believers, these disciples that are there. So one way or another, and we don't know if it's through uh, Apollos or through Aquila and Priscilla, but these people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They are disciples, which means follower or learner. Verse 2, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So when Paul meets with these people who believe in Jesus, and we don't know for sure, but these disciples were probably not the core group of people that Paul had preached to there the first time. He may not have ever met them before. It's also very possible that they were not discipled by Aquila and, and Priscilla because these people knew enough uh, about the way, about the following Jesus, that when they received Jesus as Savior, uh, the, the proper way to do things, including baptize him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But that's not what we see. And so they ask, Paul asked them, when you, when you got saved, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And the inference is, here is that when Paul sees these disciples and there's some interaction and they're talking with one another, 
There was something that led Paul to believe whether or not these guys were even saved. There was some question. Maybe it was their behavior. Or maybe it was their sheer ignorance. We don't know. But we know that these people, there were 12 of them, they at least called themselves disciples. So they're Ephesians, Ephesian believers, and this call, causes call to, Paul to question whether they were even saved. It may have been there was no outward evidence in their life. But what these believers say, they say they don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit. And what this tells us right here is these believers, these Ephesians, were Gentiles and not Jews. Because even Jews, even uh, Orthodox Jews who had been in the synagogue, they would know, they would have been taught that there is a Holy Spirit. That's throughout the Old Testament as well as the New. So it tells us these people were likely Gentiles. Now, this is also a problem that we see in the church today. Some people will say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but really their lives show no evidence of a walk with Christ. They don't act like a Christian. They don't behave like a Christian. A.W. Tozer said, you can be sure the Holy Spirit never enters a man and lets him live like the world. God's not going to leave you in your dirty diapers. He's going to change you and move you and to make you more like Jesus. That's the whole goal of the sanctification process. So when a person gets saved and the Holy Spirit comes inside that person at the time of conversion, it's the Greek word en, which means in. The Holy Spirit comes in you right from the point of conversion. But very often, a new Christ follower will lack power in their life. They'll lack God's power. The new believer doesn't necessarily act right away or behave any differently than anybody else, including his old friends. That's why it's so tough when somebody first gets saved, and it's so important to get them on that discipleship process, to come alongside of them, give them a Bible that they can read, and get them in fellowship where they're learning the Word of God. As Christians, our lives should look differently than we did before we came to Christ. So hold your place here in Acts and turn over to John chapter 20, if you would, please. John chapter 20. And if you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, there should be one in the pew right in front of you. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. So to set the stage... This is the chapter that deals with Jesus resurrecting from the dead. He's been crucified. He's been in the ground three days and three nights. He comes back from the dead. The stone is rolled away. Mary Magdalene meets him at the tomb. They have their exchange. And now Jesus, resurrected Jesus, is coming to meet with the other disciples where they're abiding in their, their apartment, if you will. Verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So Jesus, who is God, is offering these guys the peace of God. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So Jesus is not just wishing them his peace from Jesus, but he has also been to his Father, and he is extending the peace of his Father, Father God, to the disciples. And then he, when he said this, he breathed on them. That's the Greek word pneuma, breathed on them, and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So this is the guy doubting Thomas, as we know him. But actually, he was a good Jewish boy. And doubting Thomas wanted evidence. He wanted to see that this this is, in fact, the risen Jesus. He's called the twin because he was said to look just like Jesus. He was almost an identical twin of Jesus, so that they would get confused when they saw Thomas as opposed to Jesus. Verse 25, the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, the print of, his na- the, print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days... His disciples were again inside. 
The number eight in the Bible means a new beginning, a new beginning. So that's significant. After eight days, Jesus comes back. And Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Again, he is conveying peace to the disciples. And he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So this is the point of conversion, real conversion, where these guys get saved. Remember before that, they were disciples. They believed in their head in Jesus. But Jesus, they remember the whole time that they were with him, they didn't really wrap their head around the fact that Jesus said that he was going to be crucified for their sins. They were still expecting right up to the time when he was arrested that he was going to establish his kingdom right then and there and nobody was going to arrest him and put him to death. They didn't take him seriously. So they didn't really believe. And now he has come back from the dead. He has defeated death and the risen Jesus is facing them face to face. So this is their point of real conversion, where Jesus' disciples become actual believers. Now before this, one of the last conversations that Jesus had with these guys is recorded back in John 16. Now we're not, for time's sake, we're not going to go back there and read the whole, the whole chapter, but you do it. Go back and read it on your own so you see it in context. Jesus is giving them last instructions. And at one point when Jesus explains his directives... The disciples at the end of the chapter say, and it's probably Peter here, he says, now you're speaking plainly, we believe. And Jesus turns right around and he says right there, guys, do you really believe? Do you really believe? He was questioning whether they truly believed at that point. So they're disciples, but they're really not yet believers. And when he says he returns from his father, that the Holy Spirit would bring them peace. The Holy Spirit would bring them peace. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Notice here, after the resurrection, when Jesus appears to his disciples, he says, Peace to you. And you can't be at peace in your life. You can't have personal peace at all until you first have peace with God. Now before this, the Holy Spirit existed. He was around but it was in the role of what's called the paracletes. We get words like paramilitary from, from this word paracletes, and it means the helper, paracletes, one who comes alongside. The, now, the Holy Spirit in that form will come, aside, come alongside you. You might view him like your conscience. When you do something that you know is wrong or bad, the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sins. He'll make you feel bad. And the idea is the Holy Spirit, He, not an it, He is pointing you to your need for a Savior. He is always going to point you towards the ministry of Jesus, towards Jesus Christ, the person of God. So the Holy Spirit comes alongside the Paracletes, to convict a person of sin and to point to their need for the risen Savior. But at conversion, as I said, the Holy Spirit comes E-N, inside of us in the Greek. Now hold your place, continue to hold your place in Acts, but flip one chapter over there in John to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. John chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. After these things, so they had just left Jesus. Remember, this is after Jesus' resurrection. They'd had this amazing encounter with Jesus face to face. So now it's after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, so the Sea of Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, uh, along with Peter, that would have been his inner circle, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. So they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But in the morning, when the morning had now come, Jesus, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. 
So these guys, the disciples, they go from this amazing face-to-face uh, conversation with the risen, risen Savior, where Jesus tells doubting Thomas, put your hand in my side and stick your fingers in these wounds in my hands and see and believe. And so they're, they're rejoicing. So they leave this encounter and they go to the Sea of Tiberias. And remember, Jesus had breathed on them back in, that, back in that room, that apartment where they all stayed. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit that at their point of conversion. Now, I don't know about you, but when Jesus tells me to receive the Holy Spirit, I'm going to receive it. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. Jesus had given them the Holy Spirit at the time of conversion, but a little bit different from when they're, they're given power. This was the promise of the Father, and we'll look at that in just a minute. But what we see here at the Sea of Tiberias, instead of going and looking for Jesus and establishing a search party and finding out where he's at because he had told them, go meet me in Galilee. Instead, what these, we see with these guys is they go back to the old life, what they had lived before. Most of these guys were fishermen. So they're not looking for Jesus. Remember, P- Jesus had told Peter, I'm going to make you a fisher of men, Peter. I'm not going to keep you where you were fishing for fish. You're going to be a fisher of men. But these guys go back to what they did before. And they're all in agreement. Hey, I'm going to go fishing. Well, I'm going with you. Yeah, me too. Are they radically changed? I don't see any any indication of that whatsoever. Are they on fire for Jesus at this point? No, not really. Are they about Jesus' work or their own? Well, they're going back to their old life. They're going back to fishing. Now, the very next thing we see with Peter and the disciples are not being fishers of men, but they're going back to fishing. They're going back to their old lives. It's like looking over your shoulder. And if you're in a race, like Paul calls our Christian walk a foot race, you keep your eyes on the goal. You keep your eyes on the prize. If you're worried about the person that's right behind you and you look over your shoulder, you're going to trip and fall and fall right on your face. So these guys, they're looking back at the world, at what they did before. They look back on their old lives, and they don't keep their eyes on Jesus. Now, we know the rest of the story here. Jesus goes on, and he has a conversation, a very public conversation with Peter. Remember, Peter three times had denied Jesus at his trials until the rooster crowed. And in a very public way, Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I do, Lord. You know that I do. Then feed my sheep, Peter. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I do, Lord. How can you possibly say that, Lord? Feed my sheep, Peter. Now, Jesus could have asked him, but he didn't. Do you love me enough to look for me, Peter? But he didn't do that. Instead, Peter was restored. And we know the rest of the story. So in much the same way, these new disciples, these new believers in Ephesus... They believed, just like the original disciples, they had the Holy Spirit living inside of them, even though they didn't know that there was a Holy Spirit, but there's no evidence of the Holy Spirit in their life. There's no evidence of a walk with Christ there. They were lacking what the Bible calls the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the promise of the Father, to give us power in this life. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you shall receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now that is dynamite power. Dunamis is where we get our word dynamite from. In order to walk the Christian walk, but more importantly, to stand and be counted, to be a witness, a martyr. And that means being a witness even unto death to stand strong and stand for the Lord, to be a witness for Jesus Christ in a hostile world that does not want to hear about Jesus. Now that word that's there upon is the Greek word epe, epe, and it means to be filled to overflowing, to be filled with overflowing Holy Spirit dunamis power, God's Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, again, is a he, it's not an it. A lot of people get freaked out about the Holy Spirit, but this is the third person of the Holy Trinity. He is the third person. So if you love Jesus, if you love God the Father, you can't help but love the Holy Spirit too. Now it's been said, we don't don't try to grasp the Holy Spirit, but we certainly want the Holy Spirit to get a hold of us. 
because he gives us power in our life, power to stand as a Christian, power to overcome sin in our lives in the sanctification process. The gift, and it's a singular gift of the Holy Spirit, it manifests itself in several ways. He does these things for us. He gives us power. He is our helper. He seals us for salvation. That means that no one can snatch you out of God's hand. He convicts us of our our sins. And do we deal with sins as Christians? Every day. But the Holy Spirit will not allow us to remain there. He convicts it, convicts us of our sin and makes it impossible for us to stay in a place of sin. He doesn't, doesn't let us stay in that place of sin, or as I like to say, in our dirty diapers. He gives us spiritual gifts, not to puff ourselves up, but so that we can effectively serve God by serving his people. And the Holy Spirit will make the Bible come alive for each and every one of us. Look back on your life before you became a believer, before you became a Christ follower. When you first tried to open up a Bible and read it, did it make any sense to you? And then when you got saved, did it make sense to you after that? Were you able to read it and actually understand? what? Did God show you what was going on in his word? I imagine the answer to that is yes. The Holy Spirit makes the difference. He helps us to understand what the Bible says, and he helps us to even pray to God. Verse 3, And he, Paul, said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. So Paul says, Okay, you guys, you guys believe, but you've never heard of the Holy Spirit? And that means there's no power in your life. There's no evidence of a changed life. So when you believed, how were you baptized? I'm assuming somebody baptized you. So they tell him, in John's baptism. Now remember, this is the same thing that happened with Apollos. He had also not heard about this, and he had to be set straight in the same way. This, of course, John's baptism is speaking of John the Baptist. Now his baptism was a baptism of repentance. Who was John the Baptist baptizing? Jews. He wasn't baptizing Gentiles. He was baptizing Jews. Now, baptism was not uncommon for the Jewish believer. What they would do is if you had someone who was called a proselyte, a Greek or a Gentile that was coming to the temple and they were seeking conversion, they would then baptize that Gentile into the Jewish faith. But for John the Baptist to be down there baptizing other Jews, this is what caught the attention of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was like, how dare you? And on what authority are you doing these things? So it's a baptism of repentance, but it was looking toward Jesus. The problem with it is, is Jesus had already come and gone at this point. Jesus had told his disciples, this is our model for baptism. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So quite a bit different from just baptizing for repentance of sins. Now, it's don't just be good or repent here, but make Christ followers, make disciples, make learners, little Christs, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, these guys had never even heard of the Holy Spirit. So Paul can clearly see that whoever had preached to them and taught them, their work was incomplete or flawed, and he needed to correct this. Now, the big reason why he needed to correct this is in addition to that they be uh, led in the proper way of conversion and that they receive the Holy Spirit, but they also, when they get to share with somebody else, that they will do it the right way, correctly. So it's all about making disciples or other Christ followers. Verse 4, Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So here Paul is saying, In the same exact place where Aquila and Priscilla were, he's doing the same thing with these guys. And he has these Ephesians new believers, and they know enough to believe in Jesus, but Paul has to take the time to more accurately explain the things of God and describe the way to them. So baptism doesn't save us. We know that. They're not getting saved again, but he is baptizing them the proper way. And Jesus has already been there and gone So 
They're, it's not a baptism of repentance, but it's one, it's making a public statement that you are dead to the world and alive in Jesus Christ. That is the point of baptism. Jesus had given us new instructions for life, and that included on how to baptize and whose name it should be. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul again goes down and water baptizes them. He water baptizes them. This time as the way that Jesus had directed. Not to get saved, but making that public statement that they're dead to the world and alive in Christ. Now baptism didn't do anything for them. It didn't save them. It didn't make them super cool or more spiritual. But Paul is everything about doing things the right way and training up others that they would also be disciples. Now remember, assuming that these guys were disciples of Jesus, and they were, before Paul arrived, Paul is not only doing this because it's the correct way, because he is actually showing them the proper way of things so that they will do it again themselves when they get to lead someone to Christ. Verse 6, And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. There's that word again, epe. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So here we see Paul lays hands on them, likely prays for them, and this is an Old Testament principle where you lay hands on somebody. In this case, the Old Testament priests in the temple would lay hands on the offering, first of all, and make the offering take on the sins of the people and become part of the ministry. This is recorded in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4, and it'll be on the screen. Then he, the priest, the Kohen, shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. We also see where pastors lay hands, and they anoint with oil for healing. We see priests that have laid hands on other priests, anointing them or ordaining them into the ministry. This is an example here of the priest making the offering a part of the Lord's work, taking the sins of the people onto the offering. And in the same way, what Paul is doing by laying hands on these new disciples or these new believers is making them also part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. That as Christians, each and every one of us has a ministry. You may not be called to a pulpit ministry, but you have friends and family members that you greet and talk to every day. So you can point people to Jesus in the same way. When you clean the church or when you serve in the sound booth or when you serve downstairs in children's ministry, this is all a ministry of Jesus Christ that you are all a part of. So in this case, Paul is laying hands on these Ephesians praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but also making a statement that you are now part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit, God, comes upon the Ephesians. And that's that Greek word again, epe, which means to overflowing. It's a picture of a cup or a chalice being filled to overflowing with God's Holy Spirit in order to give the believer power. Jesus speaks of this overflowing power in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. It'll be up on the screen. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So what Paul is doing by laying on of hands the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this living water. And I hope that you have that living water this morning, that you are spirit-filled. Jesus had spoken over and over again about the power to overflow in the life of the spirit-filled believer. He wants us to have power. R.A. Torrey again writes, The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for the purpose of cleansing from sin, but for the purpose of empowering for service. It makes you more effective in the ministry. Everything Paul does is not just about getting people saved. He doesn't care about converts per se, but he cares about disciples, making Christ followers or little Christ Christians. Verse 7, now the men were about 12 in all. So Dr. Luke, the author of Acts, is telling us here that this is not the entire church of Ephesus that was taught this way, but only 12 men, only a part of them were instructed in this manner. 
But it's also important that, like Paul did, that we should address and correct bad doctrine. We don't just throw our hands up in the air and say, any way goes. Because that, that's where error comes into the church and we get off track and messed up. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men may be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. Because if Paul had not addressed and corrected, corrected this, others had also, others would have also been taught incorrectly. So Paul here nips it in the bud and he does it right. This also, as Christians, should give us pause. In God's power, in his Holy Spirit, is it evident in our life or is it absent? Because during these last days, and you might have seen, I put a mem up on Facebook this morning, and it talks about the coronavirus. It talks about the wars and the rumors of wars that we have going on all over the world, the riots in our land, everything that's going on. You, I, my wife and I were talking coming in. 2020 has been an awful year. It has been terrible. I'd like to hit the reset button and start over again. But did any of this surprise God? No. These are birth pains. These are warnings to us, the church, that we need to be ready. We need to get ready. And hopefully it's, it's addressed to also to our fellow Americans and those in the rest of the world that they need to be asking questions because God's return is very soon. Jesus is coming back to get his church. This is not by accident, but this is by divine design. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, said, Have ye then received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Beloved, are you now receiving the Spirit? Are you under divine influence? To put the question personally, I am afraid some professors of Christ will have to admit they hardly know whether there be any Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, again, is not a force like the Jehovah's Witness Church teaches. It's nothing to be afraid of. The Holy Spirit, He, is nothing to be afraid of. He is God, whom we want to get a hold of us, to strengthen and to empower us. Verse 8, back in our text. And he went, Paul went into the synagogue and spoke, spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. So this is actually a much better reception that Paul had gotten than he had received at many of the other cities where he had preached. Paul preaches in the synagogue, and he preaches to Jews and proselytes, Gentiles who were seeking to convert to Judaism. And he does it for three months. For at least 12 separate Saturdays, Paul is in the synagogue preaching Jesus. And we know that Paul and Apollos and others from the church in Ephesus had convinced many already that Jesus was the promised Messiah. But eventually, Paul makes a determination that he has gone as far as he possibly can here, that he has to leave the synagogue. He has preached first to the Jew and then to the Greek. He's, he's done what he always does as what his ethos was. Remember, we looked at that. Your ethos is your ethics. That is, is who you are. This was Paul's custom, but your ethics does not change. Your morals or mores in the Greeks may change and be affected by culture, but your ethos never should change. So now he segues and he turns his attention once again to the non-Jew, to the Gentile. Verse 9, But when some were hardened and did not believe but spoke evil of the way, now notice this, they spoke evil, this is Jews, Jewish, uh, Jewish religious leadership in the synagogue spoke evil of the way of Christianity before the multitude, and the multitude in Ephesus would have been non-Jewish, they would have been the crowds, the people of Ephesus, the Ephesians, and the multitude was a big crowd, essentially. He, Paul, departed from them and withdrew the disciples. So those Jewish and, and proselyte believers who had been going to the synagogue, he now withdraws them and takes them out. He separates, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So a lot going on here. Now the way, of course, is what Christianity was called. This was you were you would be called part of the Church of the Way if you were a Christian in this time. Jesus, of course, said he was the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's where it's modeled after from John chapter 14, verse 6. So finally, after three months, Paul leaves the synagogue 
And the Jewish religious leaders, out of jealousy and spite, they speak against Paul in the way, and they're trying to stir up the crowd so that Paul would be crucified or run out of town or stoned, put to death, and that the way would be dispersed. But this evil speech, no doubt, comes in the form of lies. It was all lies in order to cause a public disturbance. Now, Paul moves his base of operations. He doesn't even go around to the next town or even across town. Where does he go? Right next door. Right next door. He goes into the school of Tyrannus. Now, first, we don't know who Tyrannus is. Not much is said about this guy. And nothing remains in the historical record of him. But part of the hall of Tyrannus remains. And there's a picture of it up on the screen. You can still go to Turkey today and visit these ruins. Now, the word that's used there for school is not like a school like you and I would think of. It's more like a leisure club, and it's kind of an interesting thing when you research what they actually meant. So more accurately, it should be called the Tyrannus Hall of Leisure. Now, you might ask, what exactly did the, the Ephesians do in this Hall of Leisure? Now, remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Paul. Paul was very well-versed. He was educated in all things Hebrew. He had the classical Hebrew education. He sat at the feet of the Rabbi Gamiel, who was the, the most prominent rabbi of the day. But Paul also was brought up with a classical Greek education. He read the poets. He knew what all these uh, philosophers, Greek philosophers said. Paul was also taught at a very young age how to debate and how to speak publicly. He was well-versed in speech and debate. And this is what this hall of leisure was. In the Greek manuscript of Acts called the Codex Beza, it advises discussions were held at this school between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. And that traditionally was the part of the day when men were expected to be conducting leisure activities. So I don't know about you guys, but I would really love to have a schedule like that. So right in the middle of the workday, let's take a break and go have leisure. Now, during these hours, men, including Paul, would pursue their hobbies, they'd rest, and they took part in these great discussions in this lecture hall. So the school of Tyrannus was a meeting place where men went to argue and debate and chew the fat, just talk about things that were happening. So this is where Paul took all of his disciples and he taught them how to reason, how to debate, how to argue, how to preach Jesus to the Greek culture, to the Gentiles. So this is well applied to Paul because remember, he supported his ministry. What did he do? He was a tent maker. He was a tent maker. So Paul, he also recognizes through his ministry that a preacher had the, had the right, basically, to ask to be supported, but Paul didn't want to be a burden to the people that he preached to. So he supported his own ministry by working for a living. He supported himself as a tent maker. And this is recorded in Acts chapter 20, verses 34 and 35. And it'll be on the screen. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So Paul had a heart to serve. And he support, supported his own ministry so as not to be a burden to those around him. He worked for a living as a tent maker. But his calling was that as a minister of the gospel. He was an apostle sent out by Jesus Christ. Verse 10, almost done. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greek. So what a great testimony that is that we would continue on so that not just people in Bonner's Ferry would hear the word of God, but that everybody in the whole state of Idaho would hear it. That's the analogy. Paul's work, his ministry, all that teaching at Tyrannus, he had had raised up so many disciples, and I'm sure it wasn't just him, that by word and mouth, the gospel of Jesus Christ went out to the entire region of Asia, both Jews and Greeks. Now you will notice Luke says they heard the word of God. We as Christians, we're not responsible to save anybody, but we are responsible to share the word. 
You, me, it doesn't matter who. We have no power to save anybody. Only Jesus can save people. But we have a responsibility to share the gospel, to share Christ's love with the dying world. Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And Paul was faithful, and I hope we are all being faithful in the same way. He did it the right way to the very best of his ability, not being a man pleaser, but being a God pleaser. And he did it all in the same power that Jesus used, the power of God's Holy Spirit. This morning, I hope that you have responded positively to the message of Jesus Christ already. I hope you're not just a believer, but I hope that you're, on a, you're a, a disciple, a learner, a Christ follower. And if not, change that today. Fall in love with Jesus and continue to follow him. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, the words of Jesus, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And if you have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior today, change that. Just ask him, Lord, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I choose to follow you all the rest of my days. And if you say that and you believe it, then the Bible says you are saved. If you've never prayed for God to give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there's nothing freaky about that. It's not magic. It's just asking God to give you every spiritual gift that he has set aside for you. If you've never done that today, come down and see me after service. I want to pray for you, lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, and ask God to give you every spiritual gift that he has set aside. Again, it's not magic, it's not weird, but it's God, his spirit getting a hold of your life. Shall we stand together and shall we pray together? Father, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for your holy word, and we thank you for this time to worship you, Lord, and to spend time in your word. Father, I just uh, I pray that if there's any here that have never asked you to be Lord and Savior, even those that are watching online, that they would do it right here and do it right now. Just simply say this prayer after I repeat it, or repeat it after I say it, and if you truly mean it, the Bible says you'll be saved. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I choose to follow you all the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now during this last song, if you have prayer needs, if there's things going on in your life, come down and see me. Let us pray for you. If you have an illness or an injury or anything going on, let us anoint you with oil and pray. And if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, come down and see me. God bless you guys. Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory.
hast all things created, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. all things created, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. And Lord, You are worthy. You're worthy to be praised. And we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, Lord. Father, let our lives reflect the goodness that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for giving us the gift of, of salvation through your son, Jesus. Thank you for never giving up on us to be a God of second and third and fourth chances, Lord. Lord, we choose to serve you with our whole lives and our whole heart. Thank you, Lord. Our benediction this morning is from James chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of, of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And Father, that again is our prayer. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come and get your church. Lord, we're ready. Let us be waiting and looking towards the heavens, Father, when you come back for us. Let our lives reflect the goodness that you are. We thank you and praise you, Lord. And I just ask for your hand to be upon every brother and sister that's watching this and every brother and sister that's here today, Lord. Draw us close to you. Make us more like you each and every day. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you, gang. Have a wonderful week. Downstairs, right now, there is birthday cake. So come get a piece of birthday cake, have a cup of coffee, and fellowship. Happy birthday.